Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say my appreciation and thanks to the organizers of this conference. It's both a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, I, uh, I mean, yesterday, and we heard, we've been rem reminded that uh, the Fethullah Gülen movement, which is the strongest and the most popular and the most institutionalized, actually, Islamic community in Turkey, is also a very uh, open-minded one in many ways, which supports democracy, open society, which supports interfaith dialogue and global peace. Uh, and today we will learn more about the details of the, all the works and activities and the philosophy uh, of this movement. But w w what I want to do is just to rewind back and to explain that how such a movement could actually emerge in Turkey and what made this possible. Uh, so I'll make a little bit history. And uh, before that, let me say that. First and foremost, I think Fethullah Gülen movement is, has a very important character and that is that it is a Turkish Islamic movement. And since, uh, and although the member, also the mem members also emphasize something called Turkish Islam. So I think there is something really unique in the Turkish story of Islam, which the eminent Turkish sociologist Sheikh Mardin calls Turkish Islamic exceptionalism. And I think that's, that's what we need to understand to really fully grasp the nature of the Gülen movement. And, and before I, going back to history, let me say that when I say a Turkish Islamic movement or Turkish Islam, I don't mean that there's something special in the Turkish soul or the Turkish genes which make them a unique uh, you know, people or something. I'm the farthest thing from a Turkish nationalist here. Uh, but I think Turks had a different history, a historical experience. And people understand their religion not only according to its sacred text, but also according to the historical context which they live in. So Turks had a different context and which helped them to nurture a different understanding of Islam. Uh, and to understand that, we need some history. Well, in the beginning, there were the Arabs. They were the first people to be inspired and to be enlightened by the message of Islam. And we know that that enlightenment was a very profound one because before Islam, the Arabs were tribes making war with each other and hardly a people at all. But with the advent of the Prophet and, and Islam, they marvelously turned into a nation with a global vision. And in just a few decades, they created a whole empire stretching from North Africa to, uh, to, the, uh, to Central Asia, which would further go into Spain and uh, even to India in the future. Uh, in the not too far future. And we all know that in this Arabic empire, uh, a, a very brilliant civilization emerged. You know, the Islamic Middle East was the center of arts and sciences and letters and, and medicine and architecture uh, in the Middle Ages. Baghdad and Cordoba were the most brilliant cities on earth at the time, uh, during when London was not much of a touristic attraction. And, uh, and it was, the, uh, it was the center of the world in many ways. And uh, Arabs, I think, did this because, uh, have been able to create this thing because of their <coughs> global vision and their open-mindedness, actually, at the time. Because Islam thought that there is something to be learned from all different civilizations, and so they, got, they welcomed Jews and Christians and got their heritage. They learned from the Byzantium Empire. They learned from the... Uh, Iranians and so on. They, so they were open to different cultures and so they cultivated a whole new civilization. And when compared to this high civilization of the Islamic Arabic Middle East, Turks were, to be frank, nomads in the Central Asia which didn't have such a brilliant culture except their you know, uh, s skill in warfare. Uh, in the pre-Islamic history of the Turks, one can hardly speak about any Turkish art, philosophy, literature, poetry, or architecture. These all started, and Turks started to excel in these fields after their entry into Islam. So in other words, being Muslim was a kind of a civilizational upgrade for the Turks. Uh, but this balance, I mean, Turks are newcomers and the Arabs were already established. This balance started to change after the 12th and 13th century because the Arab world was hit 
by a few uh, tragedies or cat catastrophes. The first one was the Crusades. Uh, and the second and the even much bigger one, the much more horrible one, would be the Mongol catastrophe, uh, as the historians call it. It was the most horrible onslaught that history has ever recorded. And soon after that, even the Arab world was hit by the war change in world trade routes. Uh, in the past, like in the Middle Ages, in the, the ninth, 10th centuries, the Arabic world was so prosperous because of it was the center of the trade. But since trade has changed its route and st started to make Europe richer, uh, the Arabs started to stagnate. So after the 13th century, actually, you don't find anything which is, uh, you find a very stable and stagnant Arabic world. But at the same time, the leadership of the Islamic world st passed, started to pass from the Arabs to the Turks, and the Turks were you know, advancing under the Ottoman Empire. So I think, uh, and when you look after the 13th or 15th century, you see the Ottoman Empire as the superpower of the Islamic world. And in the 16th century, it was the superpower of the world, actually. Uh, and w there was one thing very important about the Ottomans. They were the ones who were closest to the West, who were fighting with the West, who were trying to advance into the West, which also made them, which also helped them to see the developments in the West and then upgrade themselves at some point. So they were the first Islamic nation, Islamic Tur uh, the Ottoman Turks, to face modernity. They realized that the Europeans are doing something new. They have a new technology. They're they're, they're more powerful than they used to be. So why? They started to think about it. After losing several wars, they started to reform their military first. And soon they realized that you cannot just reform yourself by changing your technology. You also get, you need to get the mindset behind that technology. And they realized that, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> they realized that they had to modernize <coughs> They have to modernize their legal system. In the uh, first, I mean, they started by translations from Western literature in the, that started in the 18th century. And in the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire reformed its legal and political system in the uh, reform edicts of 1839 and 1856. They accepted the concept of modern citizenship. Christians and Jews were welcomed in the empire. I mean, they had a space in the empire before that, but they were, uh, they were they accepted as protected people, zimmis. They were, they had a space, but they were somehow second class. But in the 19th century, the Ottomans gave them equal citizenship. In 1978, uh, 70, in 1876, uh, the Ottoman Empire accepted a constitution much before than Russia, Spain, or Portugal. Portugal. And it's interesting that the Ottomans accepted a constitution. They did not say, the Quran is the constitution, as some modern Islamists say. No, they made a constitution which honored the Quran, but which also, you know, realized temporal realities and uh, brought this idea of citizenship and, you know, limits of the Sultan's power and so on. And in the Ottoman parliament, uh, w which was, you know, which was influential in the last 10 years, like the last decade of the empire, you had Jewish, Armenian, and Christian, uh, and, you know, Greek parliamentarians uh, as proud Ottomans. Uh, and at the same time, the Ottomans, since the middle of the eighth, uh, 19th century, uh, the, the Ottomans also started to get ideas from the West and started to reconcile them with Islam. Uh, Namak Kemal, for example, which was a very important Ottoman uh, intellectual, he was very much influenced by the uh, British political thought, not the French political thought, which you know in inspired some other Ottomans. But so he, he, was, uh, he, was, he understood that democracy and popular will is not something in contrast with the idea of a divine uh, sovereignty. So he said that you know, divine sovereignty expresses itself in, in the popular sovereignty of the people on earth. You know, and so the idea of compatibility of democracy and Islam was worked out in, in Istanbul like a century and a half ago. Uh, it, even the idea of human, uh, human rights and women's rights was you know, discussed in the Ottoman Empire. And in the last decades of the uh, Ottoman Empire, we had two feminist clubs in Istanbul. And who, one of them, one of the prominent feminists was Fatma Nesibe, 
and she was a fan of the ideas of John Stuart Mill. She was also a devout Muslim. So, so despite the secularist myth-making, which, which says that the Ottoman Empire was an age of darkness and you know, we were only enlightened by the advance of the Republic, in fact, the Ottomans created the background of modernity, Turkish modernity, which continued, of course, with the Turkish Republic and which you know, continued to excel, but uh, there was a lot of background. And one thing I think which was important was that the Ottomans were trying to bring in modernity, not at the expense of Islam, they were trying to create a synthesis of Islam and modernity. The, uh, many of the people who advanced these reforms were devout Muslims. There were many Islamic scholars who were working on these issues. Ahmed Cevdet Pasha, for example, he was an Ottoman scholar in the 19th centuries. He, he, he reformed the whole legal system. And he said some laws in the Islamic tradition can change because the times change. So you can change the laws. Uh, so it was not a kind of a Taliban-like Taliban you know, past and then the, the Turks got rid of thanks to you know, some excessive secularist measures of the early republic. No, it, was, it preceded the republic and g gave the republic its meaning and its, its, uh, its basic ideas. And actually the founders of the republic, including Mustafa Kemal, the great leader of Turkey's, the great leader, Turkey's founder, was an Ottoman uh, general. So he, he was educated in the schools which were opened by the Caliph Sultan Abdul Hamid. So there's this continuity, actually, a big continuity in, uh, between the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. Uh, and I think this experience allowed the, Turk, the Muslims of the Republic, Turkish Republic, uh, accept democracy or other Western concepts like free markets, like capitalism, much more easily than some of the other Islamic nations. And I think one thing we, we should emphasize here was that after the war, First World War, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, unfortunately. Uh, but then um, Turkey became an independent nation. Whereas most of the is, uh, Ottomans, you know, pro, uh, ex Ottoman nations, they were uh, Ottoman before, they became colonies. And when you have a colonial power, what you have is anti-colonialism and which turns into anti-Westernism at some point. And I think that's, that kind of anti-Western, anti-colonial feeling and sentiment add to that anti-Israeli you know, sentiment in Palestine after the uh, advent of Israel and the occupation of Palestine. That became a driving force for many Islamic movements in the East, Middle East, which, for example, Ikhwan al Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, was basically coming from this political, you know, stance. Whereas in Turkey, the Muslims in Turkey were not you know, fighting against a colonial power. <coughs> they were just hoping to have a, they were just hoping to have more religious freedom within Turkey. Hence, they supported Turkish democracy and they voted for, you know, uh, parties that uh, promised more religious freedom. But they were more worried about atheism, for example, or the materialist philosophy of the modern age. And you see that very much in Said Nursi, which I think is a very important scholar. And I think you, you also need to understand Nursi in order to understand the ideas of Fethullah Gülen, because he, well, he, was an, he was born in the Ottoman Empire in, uh, eight, in 1878, if I'm not wrong. Uh, he was Kurdish, but he was a proud Ottoman. And he became the founder of Turkey's Nur light movement, uh, which is, I think, one of the most important phenomena in Turkish history, in Turkish Islamic history especially. And Nursi became a you know, scholar and he, and he started writing books uh, in 20s and 30s and 50s until he died in until 60s. He wrote so many books, so many volumes. And in these books, what you can find is a very fate-focused Islam. His main focus is just Resi resisting atheism, showing that there is a God, using natural theology to, you know, to make that argument. Uh, and, and so he's not concerned about politics, he was concerned about faith. And as for politics, what he demanded uh, was a, f a more free society which would allow Muslims to have the, uh, the right to practice their faith and to evangelize their faith. 
And one thing that Nursi was also uh, impressed, and one, one also important issue that shaped his mind was the threat of communism. Actually, throughout the Cold War, communism, godless communism, was the enemy for Turkish Muslims, including Nursi. So they sympathized with the West and NATO and the United States and Britain uh, because, I mean, this was a society which appreciated God, and here you have a communist danger which is threatening you. And that's why Nursi supported his students to join the Korean War to fight against the communists. And uh, he also envisioned a Muslim Christian alliance in the face of West, uh, modern materialism and you know, godlessness and you know, moral degeneration and so on. So in the early 50s, he sent one of his books to the Vatican and, you know, with a kind letter proposing an alliance based on theism, based on the existence of God and morals. Uh, so I think that heritage is important to understand because uh, although Fethullah Gülen is not a follower of Nursi, but I think it's, it's, it's a well-known fact that he has been also influenced by his ideas too. Uh, and there is some continuity, I think, in the idea of you know being closer to the Western world and, and interfaith dialogue and cooperation and so on, which I think helps us to understand uh, why how this movement emerged. At this point, let me say, I mean, let me say this. So I, I see a continuation between the Ottoman Islam, which was in peace with democracy, which was in peace with modernization for a long time, and that continued in the Turkish Republic. But the Turkish Republic also had some more radical Islamic movements, not violent, and we don't have a tradition of Islamic terrorism or violence, but we had movements which were more fierce in their rhetoric and which were quite anti-Western uh, and sometimes anti-Semitic. And I think the political movement led by Nejmettin Arbakan, the, you know, the, the whole Fazi, the, the Milli Salamet and the Refah uh, movement, the, the tradition, that political party, represents that line. It is interesting that neither the Nur movement uh, nor the Gulen movement supported this political line because that political line was basically an alien thing for the Turkish society. And because it was m mainly inspired by the more radical currents in the Middle East and, and by more radical thinkers like Sayyid Kutub or Mehdudi. And these, these started to have influence in Turkish you know, Islamic circles in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So there was an influx of a more radical brand of Islam into Turkey. And uh, we know that, for example, the um, Refah experience was ended by the military move in 1997. So many people in Turkey say that, oh, it's, it's good that we have a, such a, you know, uh, robust secular system backed by a military so that you know, we, we have be, we've been able to block this. But I think we should also see the, we should go back and see the story in a different way because I think that excessive secularism was the reason for the emergence of this radical trend in Turkish Islam. Because I mean, even the most modernist and open-minded versions of Islam were not really much tolerated and what you had was a vacuum created. So it was a vacuum. And most churches just lost their heritage of, with the Ottoman Empire. So when they looked for a new religious understanding and they were cut, cut from the back with, with, with total you know, cultural revolution, <coughs> some of them became open to some more radical ideas. So I think that excessive secularism does not, uh, does not bring a solution to the problem of radical Islam. It actually creates radical Islam in the first place. Uh, so, <coughs> so this is the whole history and if I have just two minutes left and when I come to Fethullah Gülen movement and I think, I think it is really a profound movement uh, because, not because of only what it does, but, uh, but, but also because it shows us an example of how the Islamic world can really modernize? This is a big question I mean, How the Islamic can, world can modernize? There has been different answers to this question. Some said the Islamic world will modernize by modernist and authoritarian states who will impose a you know, very, uh, very radical version of modernity, sometimes a French version of modernity, on their citizens. And you know, this is what you had to. Uh, 
uh, there's another idea, you know, developed by some neoconservatives in the United States, which argue that Islamic will, will modernize if they're occupied by, you know, Western countries. And I think uh, all, both of these approach, approaches neglect the fact that Islam has itself, uh, has within itself the potential to change and modernize, if it is allowed to, you know, discuss those issues. Secular, if Islam will modernize, I said in a piece of mind, if secular fundamentals allow, I mean, if you, allow, if you give them space, if you give them space to discuss ideas and let them flourish, and you will see that they're going to modernize. Because I think when modernity is put in front of a believer as an alternative to his faith, if he's forced to choose between God and modernity, he will of course reject modernity, and what you have is a continuous clash. But if you create a synthesis between these two, if you create a new religious understanding which realizes temporal realities but re-expresses itself in those realities, then you have a path to, to go. Then you have a path to really uh, bring a new, uh, transforming the Islamic world. I think Gulam Moments represents a case study for that, an example for that, and I uh, really appreciate uh, its eff efforts and, uh, I mean, here, here's the point. I mean, Muslims will not modernize because they're forced to do so, they're imposed. But they will modernize because they will find their faith in a new meaning, in a new context, in a new age. And the examples here show that there's hope. Thank you. Okay.